good morning again. And if you are joining us for the first time, and if you have been with us for a very long time, I welcome you. My name is Reverend Angela Denton. And before we start this morning's service uh, or the lesson that I would like to highlight, I would like us to take a moment again to just honor those who have served our country. I know my father had made his transition in January and he served our country. He served in the armed forces in the army. So why don't we just take a moment right now, just silently send a blessing to those that are alive, that have served, who walk the face of this earth, who are serving now, who have served. As we energize love in our hearts, affirming our oneness. And perhaps you know a loved one who served, who is now living beyond the veil. Hold them in your heart and all those who have lost their lives due to serving courageously and honorably, let us hold them in our hearts as well. And it is with love and gratitude, appreciation that we go forward today. And let's remember them every day. So I am gonna be sharing the meditation following the, the lesson this particular Sunday. And sometimes I look at the flow of the service and go with that flow that is in my heart. I'm going to be sharing a video clip with you this morning. And it is a video clip from the series, This Is Us. And in this video, Randall has just given you a little background has been doing some processing of unhealed hurts and wounds that he experienced with being adopted by a white family, being raised by a white family, even though there was much love in the family and being raised in a predominantly white household. So this is just a clip between him and his sister, Kate. <laughs> Randall, so I was, uh, I was hoping that you and Kev would talk, you know, clear the air. Hey. I'm not taking any sides. I know I live in LA with him, but I am totally Switzerland on this one. Okay. Randall, okay. are we good? I mean, I've been texting and reaching out and I haven't heard anything back really. And I'm just so worried about, about you and Beth and the girls, you know, with everything that's going on in the news. I'm so overwhelmed by it, I can't even imagine what you guys are all going through, so. I'm so sorry. Sorry about what? Specifically, what are you apologizing for? I'm just, I'm sorry about what's going on in the country and the protests and- Okay, but you've never apologized before. And this isn't the first black person to be killed on camera. No, it's, it's not. I don't know that this feels different. It's not for me, Kate. It, it's never been different for me. We grew up in the same house. Things like this have been happening to black people for years, and we've never talked about it. Like, not once. Not once in 40 years. I, I don't know what to say. I don't want to say, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Okay, so growing up, I, uh, I just had to keep so many things to myself because I didn't want to make you guys feel bad. 
I didn't want you to have to worry about saying the wrong thing. Well, you're right. I mean, we never talked about it as kids. And I think mom and dad did the best they could, I guess, but... But I didn't get involved. I, I didn't even... See, I hate this, Kate. I hate seeing you upset. And normally I would hug you, and I would tell you that you did all the right things. I would try to make it all okay for you. But if I did that, Kate, if I made things better for you, then where does that leave me? I'm sorry, but I can't do that. That has been my pattern all my life. And honestly, Kate, it is exhausting. I'm exhausted. And all I want to do right now is go home and be with my wife and my girls. OK. OK. Um. I love you. I love you, too. Happy birthday, sis. Happy birthday. Family dynamics, whether they are being played out on a TV screen or being experienced in real life, family dynamics can be messy and complicated. I found it very interesting when I was doing private practice and I would have several family members in my office for a session. And the individuals who gathered had quite a different take on some of the events that they experienced growing up. And even many of them had a different view of a sibling or a parent. And like Randall, many individuals feel like the people who are the closest to them, our family members, just don't get us. Our family members are our greatest teachers. And they can present us with great lessons. And usually they come with some pain and suffering. Nevertheless, if we are willing to go within and are fortunate to have start conversations like Randall began with Kate, healing can occur and there can be a transformation of our own lives and even a healing and transformation in the lives of others. But that practice of forgiveness and Reconciliation isn't easy and it is messy and complicated, which brings us to today's focus, the courage to labor for love. Valerie Kaur, author of See No Stranger, a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love, presents another word for laboring for love she uses the word push. And she borrows it as a metaphor from the birthing process. When a woman is about to give birth, they're asked to alternate between periods of breathing and pushing. Last week, we looked at the metaphor of breathing, not just what the breath does for us, taking those deep and mindful breaths does for our physiology, but it is the centering into the present moment. It is a vehicle that helps us enter the inner world and to begin to center us in the truth 
of our own divine essence. And then we move into what it means to push, to labor for love, to do the courageous fiery work of forgiveness and reconciliation in order to heal and to transform our lives. Valerie more specifically defines push as to choose to enter discomfort, uncomfortable sensations, exploring those uncomfortable thoughts, emotions, perhaps grief, perhaps rage, perhaps trauma, all as a part of the healing process. And having the courage to push, to labor through the fiery process of forgiveness and possibly reconciliation leads us to liberation, leads us to rise up as the embodied prayer music ministry will call us into at the end of the service. Breathe and push the midwife, coaches. So let us look at what does it mean to breathe and push through the process of forgiveness. First, we look at the metaphysical lens. In the revealing word, Charles Fillmore states that forgiveness means a process of giving up the false for the true. And by false, he does not mean pretend the facts of a situation did not happen. Let's not pretend that your mother, let's say, who struggled with alcoholism didn't scream and yell at you at the dinner table and possibly break the dinnerware, the plates, or throw food, or say harsh words. No, it's not that kind of false pretending that we're going to erase the details. But all too often when we encounter painful experiences in our lives or have interactions with others that cause, that can be the catalyst of suffering for us, many people take on those experiences and wear them as their identity. They wear the identity of the harsh words that someone spoke to them, especially maybe a family member. And then suddenly there's this belief, this false belief and the persona of self-limiting beliefs and thoughts seem to plague our lives and our identity. And metaphysically speaking, it calls us to embody from the highest place in our consciousness, all of our spiritual powers, but especially our powers of elimination and dominion. Elimination is relinquishing our energy from all that does that does not serve us. Perhaps it is nursing our wounds over and over. I'm not talking about the healing process. There's a place to speak about those and we'll look at that later. Relinquishing our desire to ruminate over and over about our shortcomings, our mistakes, where we went wrong, what we shouldn't have done, to hold on to shame and to replay over and over that remorse. And it is also not focusing on the badness or the wrongness of others, those individuals whose suffering has spilled onto us and it wasn't in honoring ways, it was in hurtful ways. And it also asks us to relinquish our energy from playing the victim. And what that means is using all of what happened in the past, of what somebody did or did not do as an excuse for us not to rise up and to live our highest, greatest potential. And through the power of dominion, we know that we get to, and will, will is our power of choice, we get to energize 
we know that we get to energize and focus our attention on those thoughts, to engage in those activities, those behaviors that are empowering, that will bring us into the uplifting and the healing process of our lives. Now, there are many books written about forgiveness. There's many different techniques that are given and processes. So I'm just gonna share what Valerie's uh, point of view is about um, forgiveness and then we will move into reconciliation. So for Valerie, she defines forgiveness as an act of liberation. And in that place of liberation, we are free from the heavy weight of our resentment, our grudges, our hate, our animosity of playing small and so many other self-limiting beliefs and behaviors. And it is the freedom to live in our highest potential and to claim the truth of who we are. Now, I know I talked earlier that our family members and others are our greatest teachers, and it was in reference to painful lessons. But we are all in each other's life to be teachers of greatness as well. And one of the lessons that Valerie um, of greatness that her mother bestowed on her was witnessing her mother in the, for the forgiveness process with Valerie's grandmother. It was um, her mother's mother-in-law who happened to treat her with such disdain and harshness and cruelty through her life. And so I share with you this little excerpt um, that Valerie shares in the book. After my parents scattered, sorry, the remains of the ashes, I finally confronted my mother. I asked, how, why, how did you do that? How did you find yourself able to do that? How did you forgive her? My mother looked at me and said so beautiful, time. And still, I was not satisfied. I said, but how? My mother looked at me with tears in her eyes and said, forgiveness is for you, not them. It is for you. My mother was the person who really taught me the meaning of forgiveness, that forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is freedom from hate and freedom from animosity. But for my mother, it took a very long time, a long time, where she had to do the work of grieving and fighting for herself and raging and letting others do the work of listening to my grandmother so that she could finally Reimagine a way to freedom. All of that had to happen. My mother had to learn how to breathe and how to love herself. All of that had to happen before she could even get to the point where she can say, This hatred I've been carrying, I don't need it anymore. I can be free. And in that place of freedom, Valerie's mother was able to have an open heart filled with compassion, with grace, as she sat beside the bedside of Valerie's grandmother, who was stricken ill. And as she took her last breath, and Valerie witnessed and felt the sacredness of that moment which led her into this lesson with her mother. And so some of the keys that Valerie shares with us, which you've seen in other forgiveness um, processes that um, other teachers have shared, including Robert Brummett, when we looked at unlimited forgiveness in the series of Living Originally. 
It is the call to know the truth of us, our authentic selves, to love ourselves unconditionally. And to find those safe containers for rage and anger and hurt, meaning what process will we use to help us explore our feelings of rage, of hurt, of animosity. And it is about knowing when Robert Brummett calls it unlimited forgiveness, it means that through our whole life, we will be called to this practice as long as we are in the human journey and experience. And as long as we are willing to die to the old, to be born anew and to rise up. So we must be willing to rest along the way, knowing that if we push, 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 push without those rest periods, then we cannot really truly be transformed. It is about a listening support, sharing your story with a professional or a professional who can help you with doing somatic therapy to help heal. It is the willingness to be transformed from within, not just to look at what someone else did, but what in this experience is this calling me to? What is this calling me to live and breathe into in my life? How may I rise boldly and courageously to know and to live and breathe the truth of me in more courageous ways. And it is to honor that process. For everybody, it is different. And so be willing to be present to whatever time it may take. And the forgiveness process can be done without the person who's caused that suffering to be present either. They could be even have left this earthly plane and it doesn't need for them to agree or to interact with you in order for you to do that. Like I said, there are many processes of forgiveness steps. The 12 steps has a whole amends, you know, making amends, which kind of, you know, gives a little, you know, which some of these steps that are, that Desmond teach you in the book of forgiving, forgiving, I find this process to be, you know, very powerful. So we tell the story and name the hurt. That is creating those safe containers for our hurt instead of allowing it to spill out onto other people. Now, you don't have to do it with another person, but it is powerful if you can elicit support from somebody who's not somebody who's going to go into collusion about what, how horrible it was and the victim he was. Yes, to hold an empathetic, compassionate space, but at the same time, hold to the truth of who you are. And so you can either journal it, you know, if you don't want to have a person in that process or have that person where you just get it all out, every detail. And then you name the hurt. You know, it caused great suffering. I lived with quite a bit of shame. I hid myself, didn't feel comfortable in my body, so on and so on. And then you choose to grant forgiveness. And what this means is, does it make it okay what happened? But it means that I will no longer use the story, use what happened to me to be a victim, to prevent myself from moving on and living my greatness. And then it brings you to the fourth step, which is to renew or release the relationship. You have a chance to possibly um, reconcile, which I'll get into a minute, where you can have that conversation, where there can be that open process of where somebody can um, acknowledge what happened, uh, take responsibility, and then you make an agreement of what it would look like going forward in the relationship. And sometimes that is not possible or it may not be something that you choose. Does it mean that you don't hold them in prayer, but you may not choose to engage in a relationship? So that renewal sometimes may engage the process of reconciling.
apologies. So reconciliation, if you decide to do reconciliation, um, you don't have to, but reconciliation is the act of accountability and apology. And Valerie shares, if you are going to interact with an individual, um, it can be that powerful, choose to have them in your life. But even if you choose to release the relationship, reconciliation can be powerful. And it is an act of accountability and apology. When Valerie was a young child, a um, family member, not within her immediate family, sexually assaulted her. And while Valerie was engaged in the writing of See No Stranger, that individual reached out to her and wanted to make amends, but she wasn't ready. She said that she had to do some more forgiveness work, had to create those safe containers for her rage, for her hurt. But then eventually, as she began writing the book and doing the, the raging that she felt was necessary, she started to explore the process of reconciliation and she came upon Eve Ensler's work of the apology, which there are four steps. And again, the apology, uh, making amends, reconciliation, just as there are so many different views and processes of how to do that, so is it for reconciliation. So I give you um, Eve Ensler's view of the apology. Now, th this individual, Eve Ensler, who wrote this book, was sexually, horribly sexually abused by her father. And after he died, uh, she began hearing his voice and her, him communicating. And then she started journaling. And before she knew it, like her, she was, her father was trying to make amends, she believed from the other side. And then this became the work, the book that she produced entitled The Apology. And so Valerie spoke to her, and I use the word perpetrator, like I don't like to label people, but just for clarity here, spoke to the individual who sexually assaulted and said, if you would agree to these four steps outlined in Eve Ensler's work, and you're willing to do this, then I am going to allow myself to be courageously vulnerable with you. And so what are these four steps? One, the perpetrator describes the hurt inflicted in detail. Remember in the video that we watched with um, This Is Us with Randall and Kate, and Kate says, I'm sorry. And he says, well, what are you actually apologizing for, right? It was very vague to say, I'm just sorry. I'm sorry that you're hurting, but here, it is to explain it in detail. So it might, for Kate, it might've been something like this. I apologize that I never took the time growing up and even as an adult to ask you, you know, what, what it might've been like growing up, you know, as the only black child in our family or, you know, this aired after, um, you know, that was in after the George Floyd murder. And so what would it have been like? I am, you know, I making amends that I didn't bring this conversation up with you prior because this is not the first black man that has been brutally killed or beaten. And I, and then they explained how that behavior caused suffering to someone by me not having the conversation or checking in with you or talking about our feelings, I, I'm wondering if you felt very alone and hurt and possibly scared as a black man. And then you check in and you say, is that right? And then they get to share back. In this process, the individual who is making the apology also engages in wondering, wondering like, what suffering is going on in me that I have not looked at? 
that has caused my suffering to spill out on you and other people. And in this TV series for Kate, it was the unprocessed grief of her dad being killed in a fire. It was her unprocessed grief of being abused by one of her boyfriends. And so all of that caused her to be self-absorbed, you know, in her own, not, not, I mean, she had real valid wounds, but possibly those are the things that are in the way sometimes for us being able to see how our own neglect could have caused or, or actions could have caused suffering for someone else. And then there's the detail steps to making amends and rehabilitation. Hey, you know, I'm in a 12 step program. I'm going to counseling. Hey, you know, I stole a hundred dollars from you and I am going to make amends by giving it back. It's not like, Oh, I'm never going to do that again. It is being real clear and specific about what you are willing to um, step into. And, you know, we as a country, so it's, it's not just individually, but even as nations and countries, I uh, watched a movie uh, where in Germany, in the school system, they talk about the process of forgiveness and where they generally talked about the remorse of what happened during the Holocaust and took ownership of that. And we are just in the baby steps of that happening in our country. I'd like to take a pause. Not only is this weekend, a Monday, the observance of Memorial Day, it wasn't until 1998 in our nation did it even come out about the massacre that took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 19, on May 31st in 1921, where it was the Black Wall Street, the rage of white privilege, where individuals flew planes overhead and bombed their businesses and desecrated. Hundreds and hundreds of lives were lost. 600 businesses you see right here on the screen were destroyed. 21 churches, 21 restaurants, 30 grocery stores, and you could read the rest on that screen. We didn't name for how many years that heinous act as a country. I didn't learn about it in school. And to learn about it as me as a white woman would be considered privileged because I didn't have to live through it. But now we're starting to look at that. And how are we willing to make amends, meaning to choose again? What is our behavior? Are we willing to change laws that are unjust? Are we willing to stand with our brothers and sisters who are discriminated to make sure that those laws are being, are being uh, changed? And then there's talks about reparations for people of color. So we are just in that healing process of forgiveness and rec reconciliation as a nation. And even as a world, there's a lot that we can dig deep within, but we cannot do any of that if we're not willing to look within ourselves to do the deep dive. The process of forgiveness and reconciliation are acts of pushing pushing through the fiery pain of all of those hurts, all of those wounds. And it requires individuals to be vulnerable and courageous. And I love Brene Brown's quote here, vulnerabilities are most accurate measurement of courage. How often do we think being vulnerable is for those who are weak at heart? And so my friends, I call you. I know it's not the first time and it won't be the last time that I do a lesson on forgiveness or reconciliation. Because each time we might be more, we might be willing to do some of those wounds are so deep, we're not maybe ready to do that pushing. 
but I invite you into that space where you are willing, where you're courageous to be vulnerable, not just for yourself, but looking within your community and in our nation of how I play that part in the forgiveness and reconciliation process. And so with that, let us take a deep breath as we go into prayer meditation and let me get to view the beautiful um, embodied prayer ministry that calls us to rise up. And so I invite you to get comfortable in your seat as I adjust this, the music and close your eyes. Remembering to focus on our breath. Allowing our breath to grow deep and slow. Notice the warmth of the breath as it exits and returns. Breathe deep and slow into those places within your body. call for your loving attention. bringing your awareness to your powerful and beautiful heart. It is the heart center that joins us, joins heaven and earth right here, right now. And as your breaths continue to grow deep and slow, sense your heart opening. with every beat of your heart. Sense the warm elixir of the light of the Holy Spirit alive within you, filling your entire body with living, loving presence Center deep within the bosom of your heart. Claim with full dominion your highest essence. your authentic, true self, the powerful and 
courageous embodiment of life that you are, call it forth right here and now. Call forth if it feels right, a divine master that resides beyond the veil. That we know that we are one in spirit with. We call them to be guardians of this healing that we are willing to enter. Call upon the healing energy and presence of the master teacher, Jesus who embodied forgiveness with such beauty. We call upon the Buddha of Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary. Of the angelic realm Notice that we have created an energetic presence of love, of safety, of empowerment. And in this place of loving support, look within. What weighs heavy on your heart? Where are you willing to forgive yourself for what you should have, could have done or didn't do? Breathe deeply. Call upon the love of your being and affirm, I release you, I release myself from all shame, blame, what of could have, should have. Oh, I am so ready to let go of playing small or being grandiose to hide my own feelings of regret and remorse. And hold your hands over your heart and say, I forgive you to yourself. Say it again and again. Sense the love of your being rising to greet you, to embrace you. In this place of heart-centeredness as you have assembled your divine entourage. Call to mind an individual that you are harboring resentment, jealousy, animosity, someone who is you believe is the cause of your suffering. Someone who you are ready to push through the fiery process of forgiveness. Embrace them in the circle. 
as you say these words, I am willing to let go of all that has happened in the past, of the hurt and the wounds that I have been carrying that came from your suffering. For I know that as I let go, as I relinquish the anger, the animosity, the remorse, not only do I set myself free, but I set you free. And oh, it is in my heart that you find healing and peace. For I know what it is your suffering that has clouded your vision, that has been the catalyst of your acts. So dear one, I hold you in the light of truth. May you be healed. May you be free from suffering. And as I sit in the silence, I send you my own blessing. Let us bring our attention to our breath and notice if there's any lightness, a willingness to be liberated, or perhaps the feeling of liberation is occurring within you right here and now. Breathe into it, for you are courageous. You are powerful. You are meant to be the light of the world for you are the light of the world. So let us take that deep breath in and out. Sensing your body on the chair, the couch, the bed that you are sitting on. Noticing the opening of your heart and the love that emanates from you. Beginning to rub your hands together. Stretching your arms out wide. Opening that heart deep. And when you are ready, open your eyes. And with a heart filled with love and with deep appreciation, I say these words, I love you. Namaste. That was beautiful, Reverend Angela. We love you and you are the light of the world. Good, even when I'm having problems with my computer today. <laughs> Always, Reverend Angela. <laughs> Our affirmative prayer. Centered in divine love and wisdom, I discern when it is time to breathe and rest and when it is time to courageously labor through the practices of forgiveness and reconciliation. It is now that time in our service where we have an opportunity to affirm how abundantly rich our lives are. 
I invite you to place your love offering, whether it's actual or virtual, over your heart and affirm silently together. Divine love as me blesses and increases all that I give, all that I receive, and all that I am. There are several ways to make your love offering. You can go to our website at unitybytheshore.org. There's a blue button that says give now. You can use a credit or a debit card with that. You can mail a check to Unity by the Shore at 3508 Asbury Avenue, Neptune, New Jersey, 07753. The address is on the screen. If you're signed up for the Breeze platform, you can do it that way. And lastly, there was a link in the email for the service that you received. And we give thanks for these gifts and we are so very blessed to this community uh, to be filled with caring, generous and supportive people who give graciously of their time and talent and resources. And for this and so much more, we say, amen. I now call on Vicki Mapes and this is very exciting. She's gonna give us an introduction to the Embodied Prayer ministry video that's going to play along with the song Rise Up by Andra Day. Vicki? Hello everyone. I am so excited to bring this uh, special piece to you um, and I am so grateful for all the beautiful women um, who have participated in the Embodied Prayer Movement ministry. They have worked so hard and shared their love and passion for embodied prayer over the last several months to create this beautiful piece for you. Um, embodied prayer movement is a little different than just a regular old choreographed piece. Um, you'll see that we are all doing the same moves throughout, in and out and throughout this um, beautiful dance. Um, however, my favorite saying, if you've danced with me or the group before is don't move, but be moved. And you'll see this shining through in each individual in this dance. Um, it's a choreographed piece, yet each person shines their beautiful light. So without further ado, please enjoy. Here we go. You broken down and tired of living life on a man. Can't find the fighter, but I see it in you, so we go walk it out and move mountains. We go walk it out and move mountains. And I'll rise up, I'll rise like the day.
that we have each other And for that we have each other thousand times again and we'll rise up I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just sorry, real quick. That was just beautiful. I did have a confession and saw it, but it was just as touching the second time around. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, it was lovely. And you know, the thing that I noticed too, is that it's like the beautiful smiles on everyone's faces. It was just, it felt so good. And now our prayer for protection. As the light of God, we shine. As the love of God, we embrace. As the power of God, we stand in truth. As the presence of God, we radiate love. Wherever we are, God is and I am and so it is. Amen. Amen. And I thank you, Joyce, for your support and for well done. Thank you, Matt. And I thank you, Vicki Mapes, for and the whole core group there of the embodied prayer ministry um you know you vicky and all of you individuals show that when there's an opportunity to go within and to be transformed um vicky through this pandemic had lost um well you know her business shut down her dance fitness shut down and she began instead of being that victim looking at ways how she can, it was a call to use her gifts in a greater way. And what was born was let your yoga dance and the embodied prayer movement. So you, you ladies are a, a, a model and a gift to us all. And then I invite you for fellowship.